to uh, move to the panel session, if we can go to the polls that we have out. Um, so one of our uh, panelists was stuck in a victim of uh, traffic at, uh, at coming into Boston, so we'll be a, a smaller panel, which means you can ask more questions. Um, before we get ready with the polling questions, you can see Slido, if you guys have used this before, just take your phone, you can use the QR code or type in slido.com and the password is CTL. Um, and so I just have a couple ones and while you're doing this, uh, Bill, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, Bill Stenger, uh, Connaught North America, a uh, little, going on almost two decades, if, if it's hard to believe, um, uh, in automation and supply chain. Uh, my career spanned across service and operations, uh, parcel, um, airports, and uh, the last last seven and a half years, uh, purely warehousing. So, uh, pleasure to be here, and thanks for uh, letting me join. All right, and so um, while we're waiting for the polls to go, let's ask uh, just some quick questions. So, Bill, I'll go with you so that Mohan can catch his breath from his talk. Uh, what do you see as the promising trends in automation that you're seeing right now? What do you think's happening and will be happening in the next couple years? I think Mohan did a pretty good job summarizing everything. Um, so we're done. We can call the panel longer break. I, I think it's it's a beautiful thing about having a, you know a Walmart, uh, you know, having the the, the capital and the, and the size of the organization, the speed in which they can go and try uh, try fast, fail fast, uh, and really innovate. And you know, we're fortunate to be a, a partner with with Walmart as well. And uh, I would say that the trends going on right now is consumer behavior is dictating the, what the supply chain will look and how logistics will look. That's without question. And uh, additionally, the labor topic's not going anywhere. You know, Nine million open jobs uh, presently challenging the supply chains today. It's only gonna get worse. Uh, so it's not that we have to automate to replace people. We have to automate because the customer demand is dictating so, right? Uh, with all that automation, we have to be mindful also of the importance of the interconnectivity, the intelligence. There's so much data being generated by these systems. Uh, it's, it's impossible for a single human being to let's say, to process all this information. So it's not just the physical automation, but I agree with you, the digital software and analytics and BI behind it is, let's say, the recipe for success. It's funny, you brought that up, um, on the difference between physical and digital, but a lot of digital um, automation I see is almost for, for desk work, for like RPA, you know, processing. Are you looking at a different type of digital automation or is that more the processes that uh, someone do for the back office? So there are two. One is, of course, the automation of the regular tasks that, are also, I mean, with physical and digital as well. But the, the the next layer of automation that I see is the on the digital side is about the the planning. I mean, historically, you know, there are lots of gut feels that go into a lot of the decision making that happens in the business. But replacing that with AI based, intelligence based solutions in terms of you know how much to deploy, where to deploy, when to deploy when to flow the product, how to flow the product, all of that, I don't think we have, or at least we are transforming, but you know that is one big opportunity for us to go incorporate intelligence into them so that it not only a, replaces human tax, but it actually makes much better decisions than what a human will do. Do you think that'll replace the human or will there always be a human in the loop? I, I'd say there will always be a human. It's not never, it's never going to be an autonomous model for it because the business priorities change and you always have to have uh, humans, uh, you know, monitoring the decisions, uh, but the the depth of intelligence that will go in is should be much more than what it is, and that's what we're really focused. On. I'll, I'll go one step beyond that. I think that you know, with the challenging labor force situation, we're not seeing uh, employees re being retained as long, and there's a lot of knowledge being lost along the way, or, or the lack of experience. And what I see the tools, what they're doing is empowering these, let's, let's say, less experienced operations with intelligence and making informed decisions or suggestions so they, they're not afraid to make a decision. I think that very often operations, particularly new operators, are afraid to make the wrong decision for fear of you know, backlash or you know, potentially even losing a job. And I think these tools, these, these BI tools, uh, in conjunction with ERP systems, making informed decisions on how to run the operation more effectively is where things are going. I think I would just want to add, uh, Chris, which is on the physical automation side, I think, and I probably uh, should have probably mentioned this before, but the associate feedback has been through the roof in terms of, you know, we, we are seeing that in data on a daily basis, but reduced turnover, uh, our NPS scores have beaten our plans than what we really anticipated post-deployment of automation. Yet the associates love the job. They really want to come to work in, in an automated building. Did that surprise you? 
The, the usually you hear from labor, there's a lot of resistance to automation, fear of losing the job. So that's the change management part of it, which is, you know, we have to handhold the associate um, to be able to upskill them. The, one of the things that maybe that might be critical in this is being able to get the associates trained to take on the new job smoothly, that then helps the associate not fear automation as opposed to embrace it. And that is something that we're doing in a big way through, uh, through dedicated paid training programs and education for our associates through our Live Better You program, where we actually pay for their tuition, we uh, train them on the right skills so that they can now still continue working in the same building, but not have to walk for like nine, 10 miles every day. And so can, can you tell me more about the training programs you've done? Because that's a major upskilling from walking nine miles a day to actually monitoring automation and robots. Absolutely. So Walmart has launched this program called Live Better You, uh, which is a, a fully paid uh, tuition uh, scholarship for, for our associates to get trained on specific uh, areas, could be cell operators, maintenance operators, systems technicians. Um, and of course, you know, it depends on what specific role that you're targeting. We would actually provide tailored training for the associates fully paid by Walmart. Therefore, you know, the associates would not feel that, okay, I cannot do this new job in this building with automation, as opposed to now I have a much more uh, ergonomically uh, favorable job than having to kind of walk uh, nine miles or work in like sub-zero temperatures. I mean, that that to me has been the biggest game changer for us in, in, from an associate base. And the overall, it also means that we are not replacing people or we're reducing the headcount. If anything, we're gonna be same or even more associates in the future than what we currently have because the business is growing at a rapid pace and that'll more than compensate for uh, the, the automation. So one thing, I'm just curious, uh, with the automation, and you brought this up, Bill, um, do you find, how do you empower them to make those decisions to problem solve? Because that's what you need them for, as opposed to if you're just a picker, you're following orders. It's, it's a mindset, it's not just an upskill of, of individual skills. How do you let them know that they're empowered to solve problems? And do, is that a problem or does that just happen naturally? I, I don't see that as a problem. And in fact, I think it's, it, it, it is part of the culture uh, where what, you know, at the end of the day, the associates understand that their job is to serve the customer. And how we do it is what we're really debating about. And once that, you know, we have, you know, aligned on the fact that, you know, this is what you ultimately, what you do is manifesting for our customer. I think the adoption rates have been significantly better than what we had anticipated. And um, I don't think we really felt that kind of resistance, Chris, in terms of uh, our associates taking on these jobs. And I mean, like, like I said, I think if anything, they are, they are actually <coughs> wanting to do, do these jobs than opposed to going back and working in a traditional manual building. So that's a, that to me has been a big revolution. Well, how are you seeing this at, at other companies? What are you seeing other companies do? Because I assume you have more customers yeah. than just Walmart. Uh, yeah, um, I think Walmart is, uh, again, the resources and, and, and the knowledge and the, and the people you have, uh, you're sitting at different echelons, so to speak. There are a lot of smaller regional retailers, startups and things like that, that really are, are looking for uh, the experience, the know-how, because um, they don't have it in-house. And I think that what we're seeing is that they're looking for partners um, that can you know, tie everything together. There's not, I know there's not a silver bullet, if you may, for the supply chain and automation, but I think that it's about finding the right uh, strategy and the right partners to, to go on the journey with you and to own it together. Um, and I think that is something that is becoming much more prevalent now because people don't fear like they used to. I think automation was a very scary topic. And I think that automation now is not, uh, it's, it's I mean, automation, you could, the definition between automation and robotics, you could argue all day long about what that really means. But I think automation has been around for, you know, uh, hundreds of years, with, 100 years with, you know, manufacturing and conveyor and things like that. It's the, um, the know-how and powering them with things like ASRS, with AMRs and robotics, uh, when they don't necessarily have the resources and finding the software and uh, let's say BI uh, leaders in their space to, to, to drive that uh, drive that ball forward more rapidly. So in, in your other companies, you haven't seen, what has been the biggest hindrance to adoption of automation? It sounds like for Mohan, for Walmart, it was not the labor getting them engaged, the workforce getting I, them I engaged. I think it's the fear of the unknown. I think that you know the people making these decisions, supply chain leaders that are putting their careers on the line to hire and find a new automation partner. Uh, it takes first off years to develop, I mean, as as we know, it takes years to develop the right solution, uh, and then when when it's all said and done, you've designed something, and the business may have fundamentally changes like you know COVID did for all of us. Um, I think that there's the fear of adoption because there is a significant capital investment 
in, in the early days. I think now you're seeing startups and new technologies that you can fail fast and much more affordably. Uh, the supply chains can, I'd say, take these decisions much more rapidly without uh, having to go to the board for you know, 20, 50, 100 million dollars in the capital, you know. Yeah, it's, it, it seems to be that automation used to be, uh, you know, heavy investment and you lose all flexibility, but you're really efficient. But that's changed over time. Moen, how has how that changed? Is there still a trade-off between flexibility and efficiency? There is. I mean, and that is one thing that, you know, we constantly evaluate. And, and it's, it's not an easy problem because, you know, there are, and it also kind of may, is, a, is a parameter that, does, that in the decision making of which automation you want to go with, right? Flexibility is one of the big factors to say if the business priorities change, which is oftentimes it changes. What I see as a plan for three years out will not be the same next year, right? Um, in the wake of changing business priorities, can your automation still be the right choice? I think is an evaluation that we will have to do uh, uh, regardless and make sure that your, you know, it, is, it can support changing mix, it can support changing volumes, it can support uh, you know, different shopping behavior from the customers. Um, so we trade that off and then we all still make sure that you know, will the capital investment make sense and we are, able to, are we able to, to pump the right kind of volumes through these assets to be able to lower the overall fixed cost because that is a big factor in the decision of making uh, on automation, which is do I have enough volumes to justify that automation? So the lot of the stress would be on the pre-work to make sure that you know, it is robust enough uh, and you know you're accounting for all business changes uh, that can potentially come uh, come up. I 100% agree with you. And I think that you can have the vision, and again that vision changes. But I think the goal is to really to identify technologies that are modular and scalable, and that you can kind of bend with the customer demand. And you're, you hit the nail on the head there. I think that's what's really um, the the main drivers towards automation today is partners who can be flexible with the business and not to say look you're stuck with this. Um, you're going you're gonna to depreciate over 10 years, then you're just going to build something new. Yeah. You know? I'll, I'll want to add, add one example just to kind of bring this to life, right? So think about um, our e-commerce fulfillment capability where we are an ASRS system that is bringing products in totes to customers, So, which is the core capability of uh, an, an automation system. Now, if, you know, if the business changes priorities are, or things like that, we still want to find alternate use cases for the same technology and that is what we evaluate and we have some backups to say, okay, can I use this for supporting the stores, store distribution? And what do I, what, what more do I need or what changes do I need in this automation to support that? Now you have two or three use cases for the same automation technologies, therefore if one doesn't pan out, we still have options to utilize the asset and still add value to the business. And that's something that we constantly, as my, as, you know, my group in strategy, that's literally what we do day in and day out to make sure that any installation that we do stands the test of time. Okay, so let's look at the poll really quick. And of course, it's totally spread out. It's almost a normal distribution, right, with average of five. So I asked how, how what is your current level with you? And so we have a wide range here of, of people, some of them, and kind of skewed to the lower side. So Bill, what advice would you give a company that is low, that is below, say, four on that scale of automation to dip their toe in that automation uh, I would say the one thing that is a common problem across all leading supply chains is the um, inability to, to communicate across channels. I think you have a C-suite vision. I think you've got a supply chain executive vision, an operator in a retail. And I think that very often you'll have uh, silos. So I always tell our client the number one thing is that we've got to have a, a buy-in across the entire organization of where we're trying to go uh, with this project or this, or this idea. Um, you would be surprised how very rarely that happens. <laughs> um, so, um, dish some dirt. Give us some examples. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Career Pan move. Panels are not move, supposed right? to all agree with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Limiting move. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it gets, we're prominent supply chains across every industry you can imagine. Um, but but I think that um, in the past, and, and I, I mean I've gone through this experience even recently, is that you build something with a vision. Um, and where you're trying to go with it, and then if but if you don't run that site as was intended, it has detrimental impacts to the overall success of the project, which in turn affects the conversation on, on the IRR with your leadership. So um, the communication is critical to the success of any project, in my opinion. You bring up the word silo. What, what I thought was really interesting from your video, Mohan, the uh, making of the, of the uh, pallets where it improves the store. That does not help the warehouse. That helps the store. And so if you're siloed for efficiency measures, you're actually taking 
somewhat of a hit to improve the efficiency somewhere else. Was that a hard sell? No, not at all. <laughs> if you think about this, right, the, the, one of the things that we really wanted to, it's, it's about just aligning on the fundamental principles. And for us, reducing complexity at the store is at the core of what we want to do. If it means that I need to complicate my upstream supply chain, but I can actually have millions of associates that are in the store focused on servicing our customers. Why? Why, why are you simplifying there? Is that because there's so many more of them or because? Because the, the role of the associates in the store, the way we see it, is about servicing the customers ah. and, and not moving products and stocking shelves. So I, we would want to take that, those hours away and translate those hours into talking to, us, to customers and then making them feel at home in the store servicing their needs. And that to me is, the, is, a, is something that is the core of our existence as well, which is let, you know, focus the time on the customer. And we would, this parallelization, by the way, the other thing is you know, we are, while we think it is complexity upstream, but with the automation that we're bringing in, it is not. And you know, we are able to you know, build pallets in, I'd say 15 minutes, 10 minutes, right? And then, and the pallets are much more intelligently layered. So you could have a layer that goes to an aisle the next layer that goes to a different diet. Imagine humans trying to figure this out and trying to build this pallet manually. But you always had that one expert who could build a perfect pallet. Was he yeah. resistant to the machine? <laughs> Probably the one expert, but the rest <laughs> of the 99% of the associates <laughs> wanted the solution. So, and the tall pallets and then the ability to go nine feet high and having a step to be able to do that. I mean, those things you, you, can, you cannot even really uh, accomplish with, with, uh, with humans and, and have them really focus on you know, on, on the bugs and making sure that the system uptime is high, making sure that they provide real real time feedback to improve the productivity of the automation. So to your earlier question on empowering associates, that's where the role of an associate comes in, which is they are still adding value to the business. They are continuing to make sure that these automations are working at their levels of productivity and their uptime is 99 plus percent and so on. So that to me is where the value add comes from. You, you tie back in the GS1 piece here, I mean, in, in the topic of, of pallet build, um, you know, we, we instituted a program in the last few years where, you know, fit for automation, where we're not collecting length, width, and height dimensions. We're collecting 60, 70 attributes specific to a, a, a product so that we can get the densest pallet build possible, but also be mindful of stability, rigidity, and things like that. So we don't have shrink happening in, in, in mid transport. So these are, these are huge topics that I think that we, we as, as Canop have put an emphasis much further up the supply chain and something as simple as master data that's affecting automation because we all know automation's only going to grow from here, right, based on labor. So you, you brought up the D word, the data. So everyone's master data file is usually the worst yeah. shape of anything, but automation re relies on that. And well, I know the next session we'll talk much more about data, but how have you seen the automation that can only be as good as the data you feed it? So has this changed the way you've seen in other companies where the quality of their master data, or is that an Achilles heel for these systems? I, 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 I like this, I can open. I, I think it is absolutely- You can talk about bad companies. It's, it's, it's absolutely an Achilles heel. I think everyone in this big. room can, can say that if anyone tells me their, their data is good, then I would, I, I, I'd have to call you out on it. But I think that it, it's only as good as the operators who are running it. And I think what we have to do is we have to empower the operators with uh, tools that are easy to interact with to collect the the proper data, I'm a big proponent of putting that data in, in, a, in a data lake and sharing that across your supply chain. Because in Ambient Grocery, I'd say I, I, probably 70% of my SKUs are, are consistent across the supply chain, right? And if I, can, if I can ensure that I've got a site where I'm capturing really accurate, relevant data points, I, I, can, I can benefit the entire supply chain network, yeah? So let me go back to something that Mohan, that, that you said, um, making it simple. I love that, the idea to make everything simpler for the associates at the store. Can you share with us any numbers as far as what percentage of their time is now spent not on back office things? Has that, I assume that's reduced. It has reduced. I mean, I cannot publicly share the numbers, but what we have seen is the, the unloading time, um, the need to resort these boxes to aisles. And um, I mean, if you walk uh, a store, you'll see that the amount of time it takes to to unload, to resort, to stock, and so on, versus the opposite of just taking a pallet all the way to the shelf. Uh, we've see, we have seen significant improvements, and part of the reason why we're investing tens of billions of dollars um, uh, to, on, on the upstream supply chain, because we are actually are starting to see the value, both in terms of hours, customer ex uh, associate experience, and customer experience as well. And are you seeing the same thing at other companies? Uh, I, think, I think you've, I mean, again, Walmart summarizes it nicely. I think you guys got a pretty good uh, finger on that pulse. I would agree. Okay. So looking at the 
poll for I asked for one word describes your experience in implementing automation. Um, this is actually weird. Usually you, you show the answers and people are like lemmings. They log, log, log on to things. This has so many different things. Um, for some uh, resistance, complexity, exciting, bias. What have you seen, Bill, in your, what do you think the biggest hindrance that companies you work with that is preventing them from going further? I think the, the, the fear of complexity, and, and, and these systems are complex, don't get me wrong, um, but it's, it's our job in our industry to basically make that, complex, that complexity much more simplistic to deploy. And I think that's where the intelligence and the software uh, layer of these systems is really moving uh, exponentially forward. Um, we also see that you can deploy um, let's say a scaled down versions of solutions. You can familiarize uh, supply chains with uh, technology in advance of going doing the big project uh, with, with pilot sites. And I think that that has also been something a way to mitigate that fear, the sense of complexity, uh, and reduce that resistance across the organization. And without question, you know, automation is not it, it's 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 gotten more expensive. It, inflation has affected every one of us, and that has been a topic and discussed. You know, the return on investment and where where automation fits in the equation. But the the, the overarching I mean, message from the supply chain leaders to me is that I don't have a choice. I have to do something, or I'm going to erode my customer base. Their service levels aren't changing. Uh, they demand it uh, more conveniently. They demand it. Uh, faster, they demand it, you know, at, at the best possible price. And supply chains have to uh, take, let's say, the steps and invest in automation to retain their, their their client base. And so, if we look at the whole chain of operations for the supply chain, where's the last frontier for automation? Is it picking of eaches? It sounds like I thought pallet building would take a lot longer. I'm, I'm actually so automated pallet building. I thought would take wouldn't have been a, as a complete at this point. Where do you see the last frontier? What is not being automated that you think will be? I think in, when it comes to distribution, every aspect of it, I think we would want to infuse some level of automation. It may not be 100% automated because there will be products that still need manual handling. Um, in transportation, I think you know uh, we are obviously uh, launching drones in different parts of the country. Um, we are launching autonomous vehicles uh, that could do point to point. Um, and then eventually, you know, we would want to do long hauls also through some autonomous vehicles as well. Like to me, those are those, uh, from a transportation perspective, there are some areas that probably are little out in the future, but when it comes to distribution, uh, I do see that we will continue to disrupt ourselves um, as we go into the future. And there, I mean, there are different value propositions based on the complexity of the task that you do. If it is about, Picking each is the value of automation is pretty significant. If it is a pure pallet flow building, you know the value may not be that much. So we, that that's typically how we would even prioritize our investments in automation. And there is almost a pecking order that we would go with. But eventually, with the scale and size that we would have, I think we will end up uh, automating a majority of the supply chain and having our volumes. I mean, one of the metrics that we use is what is the percentage of the volume that actually fl is flowing through physical automation, I would love to also see a metric that says what percentage of the volume is where the planning and execution is also automated from a systems perspective. Mm -hmm. And then you have those metrics and those have to go north all the way up to like 90%. And that's when I think truly we would be disrupting ourselves and, and you know, really having an impact on cost itself. Bill, what do you think? What's the last frontier? Um, I, I do the last mile autonomous delivery. I think I do see that that be as a, a significant hurdle to overcome. I mean, there's been obviously ma massive I'd say, advancements in the space, um, but I think that's a, that's a big one for me. A, a few years ago, I, the, the robotic each picking was uh, a topic. The problem was it, it existed. Um, it was the vision technology behind it that was really the, the hindrance, I would say. Uh, and we've we've got a partnership with a company uh, um, that has I'd say advanced that that the vision piece where it's. It's a self-learning um, vision camera that every time we deploy it, it's not having to learn from scratch. It actually takes all the learning. So it doesn't have your specific uh, data inside the robot. It, it just knows the, uh, the the type of, let's say, packaging it's handling, um, the shape, the dimensions, the weights, and things like that. So that every time we deploy a new robot, it's, it's, it's immediately hitting the ground running. And we're seeing now that robot, even in grocery, uh, 60 to 70 percent of, of items can be picked by a robot now for a, for an e-grocery basket, uh, and in traditional supply chain and, and pharmacy, near near obviously 100 um, percent, and that's a general merchandise. 85 to 90 percent can be picked by a, a each picking robot now. So I would not have. I, I was surprised how fast it advanced in the last 
the last five years. And the one thing I would also I want to add, one is just the, the, the pure value of automation at a transactional level. But you know, different companies are at different scales. So like, I mean, we have we have the the fortune of you know the scale that we have where we can justify automations with the volumes that we would flow. But now you go down the spectrum of companies. I think one is you also need to make sure that you have sufficient volumes to sweat those assets yeah. to be able to justify automation. So then the last frontier is not necessarily just what I just said. It could even be each picking is manual is still better because the fixed cost of automation may not justify or pencil. Uh, for the variable uh, cost benefits. That totally agree. That, that's a really good point. So, but scale's a double-edged sword, right? Because you can't, it's hard for a, a company of your size to incrementally add something. When you make a step, it's a big step. And so one of the things, I want to go back to the pallet building because I'm fascinated by it. To make that work, you need to know this format of each store. Is each store format in Walmart identical? Or do you have that, so the pallet, they need to know which store they're going to because I imagine the the layout changes or modifies season to season. So how is that coordination? Is that a, is that a hurdle or is that something that's easy to do? No, so we, we do need not only the, the format of the store, we also need to know the aisle composition as well. Yeah. And eventually we would want to get to a, a four foot section. So if, if I had to go stock a four foot section, can I create a very dedicated load? It could be a layer um, on a pallet that just goes to that four foot section. And I mean, it's not like we have everything buttoned up or uh, ready to go, but we are con continuously evolving. But if that information is fed in, comes back to the point that you made on data, if that information is fed in, the automation has the ability to play this Tetris game um, to build the most optimal three-dimensional pallet um, so that can be taken to, a, uh, to, the, to an island and stocked. So capabilities exist. We are obviously feeding in the more data, the more accurate data we feed in, the better we can get. So it's just north from here. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, a planogram is not always available. So I think a uh, planogram, in my opinion, has been the best way to maximize the, the, the density of the pallet build. Um, but additionally, if you don't have that information, particularly I'd say in, in, in the grocery retail space when you have multiple banners under you, I think that it's very hard. So you start grouping by commodity as opposed to grouping by planogram. Uh, it does have some negative, let's say detrimental impact to, to the overall density of the pallet, but grouping by commodity and then applying certain rules around number of aisles of travel distance uh, on, built on, a, on, a, on an average pallet. So back to your comments earlier, there's a trade-off. You know, you got to figure out, okay, what am I trying to achieve maximum density in my, my truckload to the store? Am I trying to minimize the labor impact in the uh, and, 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 the, and maximize the customer experience? These are all things that have to be discussed across the entire supply chain organization on the way forward. I'm going to go to ask some questions that are coming in. Thank you for putting these in. You can also upvote the questions as they come in. I won't always listen to your preferences. Um, that's why I'm the moderator. But uh, you can actually signal which ones you find more interesting. Um, let me ask a question um, to you, Mohan. How do you prevent people from blindly trusting the recommendations of any automation or orchestration engines? Any decision support system has this challenge. You have people who follow it blindly or totally ignore it. Was that a challenge, and how did you train people to be able to make those kind of decisions? I mean, it, 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 for us, it just comes back to you know, really putting the facts out there. Um, and the other thing, you know, uh, that we rely heavily on is pilots. Um, it's sometimes it's really difficult to predict, uh, to estimate, no matter what math and what science you use and all of that, you still have challenges in being able to pinpoint the true productivity impact of an automation solution because we don't know how it actually manifests inside a, an FC or a DC. We don't know the pallet, the cases come in the way they're supposed to come in, the dimensions are different. So we have all of these challenges. So what we have done uh, very well over the last five, six years is we've piloted all the technologies that you've seen. We have had pilot instances in different parts of the country, much smaller scale, but enough to, for us to be able to have a much greater level of confidence. And that was when we then uh, you know, infused billions of dollars in kind of uh, scaling that automation up across the supply chain. So to me, that you know, helped really bust all the myths and really folk, bring folks to the table to say, okay, now I'm, it's not my, it's not any subjective decision anymore. We have the facts, we have a live example. Now let's make a decision on, do we want to invest in automating that particular building? A question, um, if you can give this, if you can't, uh, just, just say so. What percentage of your warehouses have this level of automation that you showed in your videos? What percentage? I, I can't. It's a hard number to say, because exactly. they're not it's, it's, I mean, it depends on why. It's units, number of buildings, number of SKUs. It's very different in terms of how you look at it. 
But um, I, I can say this, yeah, over the next five years, I, I'd say we have a majority of our network, perishable, ambient, e-commerce, would be flowing through automation, if that helps. Uh, I mean, we are on the journey. Different automations are, are at different stages of their evolution, but I think we have a very clear plan of execution over the next five years um, with proven pilots as well. So we are confident that a significant portion of our supply chain would flow through automation, at least for case order filling, each picking, um, and pallet building, uh, as well as are the market fulfillment centers at the, in the back of back of the stores as well. So that's that's how far I can go. Okay, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, another question for you: How do you balance transportation and fleet optimization with dynamic DC sourcing? It's a total cost equation. So depending on whether it's e-commerce versus uh, stores, I mean. One thing we do on the stores is what we call stores realignment. So we constantly, so we have 42 distribution centers, 4,600 stores, roughly call it 100 stores per DC. But it's not always 100 for every DC. We constantly keep changing it just based on the changing dynamics of the demand. That's one. Um, that balances the cost of transportation to the distribution. In e-commerce, what we have is this, we call this multi-channel sourcing engine. Uh, MCSC is what we call it. It basically, every time you place an order, in milliseconds, it actually determines what's the best uh, way to source the order from, which means which FC does it have to be fulfilled from, which carrier or which transportation model we have to use to ship the product, and when we can commit uh, the order for delivery to the customer. So when you open up an item, it actually shows hey, it's available for next day delivery. And that's that computation is happening in milliseconds, and the number of possibilities runs into billions. So the, the sophistication of the engines that we build is so critical and hold this this new technologies of generative AI and AI will will play a big role in that. But that engine is making the trade-offs of better better fulfillment cost but longer transportation or you know shorter transportation but worse fulfillment cost. Ultimately, making sure that the customer's SLA is met. So you, that is the that is a non-negotiable. And then we work back to determine the best sourcing model for that. Makes sense. Um, so, Bill, I question for this and tell me if you can answer this. Because the, the question is, how are you selecting and or testing for automation vendors? You're from the other side. How are you seeing the, I guess it's an RFI or an RFP process. How are you seeing that changing? And can you give us some insights in how that's being done? Maybe I can make a, rec a request. Um, <laughs> I think that what you described is actually the right strategy, which is a, typically depending upon the level of investment, these, these are multi-year journeys together where you are identifying the right, the right partner to work with. Um, very often you get these these phone calls or these emails saying, hey, we'd really like to get you guys to propose something. Here's our here's our master data. Here's our uh, our, our peak and average uh, order profile for last year. Uh, I need a price in two weeks and uh, love, love to hear from you and hope you participate. Uh, that doesn't work. And I'd say 90 percent of the time, Canop would decline your request. Uh, we have a, a, a personal reputation. I think the retailer has the one they want to keep in, intact as well. And I would say. Um, please take the proper time and do, and do your due diligence and uh, don't rush this. Uh, and as much pressure you might be getting from, from, from senior leadership, I think that you've got to really uh, pay this uh, the attention that's due. For me, a successful RFI or a period of time to analyze the right solution is probably a four to six month journey. Uh, pretty common, I think. But if you start talking about things like the next gen program for Walmart, I mean, that was a, a four or five year journey to figure out what was the right solution with many different people with different ideas on how to solve the problem. So um, give it time, don't rush it, and, uh, and get it right the first time. Because I think that's what will lead to building the confidence and reduce this fear of complexity uh, and risk in an organization. Anything you want to add about the bidding or vendor selection process? No, I think he's he's nailed it. I think it's so important to to go slow, to go fast, like especially when you're deploying these big vending machines on in million square foot buildings that you don't have an option to walk away. So doing the right kind of due diligence is extremely important. And if it's it's painstaking, but it is worth all the effort for you to be able to save billions of dollars on the other side. So I fully agree with it. And I think there are standard RFP templates, and you know we go to a great level of detail item profile, order profile, package profile, uh, the seasonality that he talked about, the, the unit capacity, case capacity, reserve versus uh, you know, uh, the uh, automated storage. So we really go into that level of detail to be able to plan the buildings out. And like I said, 
all of this needs to ultimately still be, despite doing all of that, we still want it on a pilot before we take a decision. Let me ask a question about pilots, and I'm curious from both of your perspectives on this. Can you give any sense of the percentage of pilots that don't go to scale? Is it a 10, is it every other, every pilot successful? I know, every pilot is not successful, that is for sure. <laughs> uh, it's hard to pin a percentage, but um, you know, we've tried a lot of technologies over the last, I mean, I've been in Walmart for 10 years, and I've seen, I was telling uh, Bill earlier in the, at breakfast today, I've seen so many technologies come and go, um, that, but now what I'm seeing is a concerted effort across every network within our business uh, with uh, powered by proven automation. So it almost feels very different now than what I've seen in the last 10 years. So I'm very confident and excited about what we would do, but very difficult to put a percentage to it, but there's always instances where we, uh, there are several instances where we actually fail and we've moved on. Is that, is that something that you, the company has to be comfortable with culturally? Because a lot of times no, no one likes to lose, because a, a, a pilot is someone's baby. And so if it doesn't go, then you, you're killing its baby. Is that something that uh, you see in other companies, Bill? Yeah, I, 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 you have to be willing to, to take on that risk. And uh, I think that you, yes, one person's feelings might get hurt if a pilot fails, but there's a lot more at stake. Or they might get fired. They might get fired. Uh, a lot more at stake. Uh, <laughs> it may, may, may have a hard time finding a job in the supply chain, uh, depending on the project you're on. But I would say that uh, the pilots, uh, we, we like them, but we also hate them. Because to your point, uh, if a pilot, especially when you're doing something for the first time, things that you could not have foreseen. It's always the thing that you did that you don't anticipate that goes wrong and that you have to work through that. And there's a certain level of visibility at the, the C-suite, right? That if this pilot does or doesn't work, it will dictate the, the strategy. And I think that we love to do pilots because you want a new opportunity to solve a problem, but it's also the risk of the pilot not achieving what you set up to accomplish together. And um, but Do you sense there's a greater tolerance for failure across the industry, not just your company? I, I, yeah, I, I do actually. I think they're scaling it down. I mean, this if you it look at- as big of a bet. If, if, I mean, if you look at what, you know, what we set out to accomplish, I guess when we started with, with, with Takeoff Technologies, the, the MFC program, the MFC program was a way to- Can you uh, explain what MFC oh, is? Oh, sorry, uh, micro-fulfillment or the, uh, the market fulfillment center that, that Walmart has. We wanted to uh, establish a way of going to market rapidly to serve, service the e-grocery market. Um, E-grocery adoption was much slower, was being far outpaced by, as a general merchandise retail, and nobody wanted to go and build a large-scale grocery DC, because to your point earlier, the, the, the demand wasn't there at the time. Um, throw gasoline on the fire after the pandemic, but the MFC served as a, an enabler to prove that, look, you could, you could serve the last mile, you could make e-grocery profitable for the retailer. And I think that was kind of the, that's, that's where I started to see the, the shift. It was right around the same time with some of the pilots at Walmart I saw doing, we're doing it. I think probably in the last three or four years, really the pilot conversation has really, I'd say, uh, sped up across the industry for me. Got it. So a bunch of questions here. We're not gonna be able to get to them all, but Mohan, is there something you'd like to ask your suppliers to do to reduce the complexity down at that store level? Are there things that they can do differently? Yes, I think one of the things is, um, we have you know, worked with suppliers to create the right format of the product that comes in. Um, that is sometimes, you know, sometimes there are, there are products that are not automation friendly. And like I said, you, know, you want to make sure that every item to the extent possible flows through the automation technology, uh, which means that we may have to work with suppliers uh, to be able to do that. The other instance is, you know, we have drop shippers um, or what we call direct store deliveries, maybe that's the right word, so where we, the suppliers directly fulfill the orders to the to the stores. I mean, with automation, we would want to be able to uh, really utilize the efficiency that we have created to be able to bring a lot of the volume in house. Which, because the more volume that we can control, the better availability for the customer. From a, and if I really think about that, keep the cost aside. If I'm able to make the product available for a customer who walks in or wants to pick up or who wants it delivered home, uh, online at, uh, to his home, um, if that is being solved we can really solve the rest of it pretty easily. And so uh, taking control of the supply chain, I think is, is, a, is a key enabler of that. And uh, automation is an enabler of that. And therefore, you know, you see that, that cascading effect of the, the fundamental thing is, can we automate, create productivity, create capacity, and then we can do a lot of these other programs uh, with automation. Can I make one request to the suppliers as well? Sure, go for it. Um, the load carriers, you know, the pandemic was, uh, 
uh, it was really the number of white wood that was entered into automation versus the Chaplin Pico type of pallets or the, if we could really be mindful of the impact downstream to your customers, the load carriers that you're shipping to their distribution, the fulfillment networks, how that impacts their operation, um, that would be a huge accomplishment. You're calling the, the load carriers, the trucking? The, pa the pallet itself. The pallets, okay. Yes, so the pallets have become really a problem in the last few years for us, I know particularly, and I'd say I would love to have someone understand what the impact is. Well, you may be cutting cost, or maybe there's availability of a quality pallet. Think about how that's affecting your retail partners downstream in their distribution environment, for sure. Got it. Another question coming from left field. What needs to be changed or added to high school curriculums to better prepare the upskilled workforce required to s support working in automation? <laughs> I'll go first here. I, I, I would love to see, um, I would love to see the, the retailers, the automation companies to get more involved with helping develop the curriculum that pertains to, I'd say, um, maintenance, electrical, mechanical technicians, the for, um, I'd say, uh, th those types of jobs, uh, software development, uh, robotic engineering. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's a plethora. I, I would love to say if you are passionate about, I'd say, advancing the curriculum in your, in your, in your school system, in, in your district, like, there are so many companies scattered across this country that I would love to get involved and participate. Uh, you just gotta reach out and, and ask. I, I don't think you're gonna necessarily find uh, the level of productivity, uh, the, the, the level of engagement on the high school level right now, unfortunately, but I know that we are really active in the, in the collegiate level, trying to, and I'm sure you guys are as well, to try and fill these, these impossible positions to get right now. Any opinions on high school? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a high school kid, so definitely have a ton of opinions. You know. And my, my younger son, who's nine year old, he'll give me feedback on Walmart deliveries. Um, he, he does benchmarking for me with Amazon, and he'll tell you, you should have done this better, you should have done that better. So they are a lot more knowledgeable than, you know, than what I thought they will be. And uh, we constantly get feedback. They, are, they, are, they understand e-commerce, they understand parcel shipping, um, they understand last mile delivery. You know, and it's a bit surprising for me, to be honest. Um, but I think the awareness is great, but uh, to, to Bill's point, if there is an opportunity to create programs that are tailored towards, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, capabilities, right? Being able to understand what shipping, you know, e-commerce is all about, automation is all about, it really prepares them well as they get into the, uh, their, uh, you know, undergrads and, and beyond, and, and really, you know, positions them for success. And um, I think I've seen examples of that happening in schools with other companies, and I, you know, I, something that we would definitely want to do as well. And of course, you know, we, have, we also want to work with the universities um, in a big way to be able to really engage and tap into their um, you know, capabilities to be able to disrupt our business. Any, any universities in particular? I think MIT probably <laughs> will be one of them, I guess. <laughs> um, so we only have a minute or two left. Let me ask the last question. Um, AI, is it hype or is it reality? And where is it on that spectrum? Hmm. I'm going to go first. You uh, I'll let you go after me. I'll, I'll open it up and let you know. It's tee up so you hit a home run. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> I think it's 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 not hype. It's real. Uh, it's 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 too often in the voc it's like digital twin. It's it's too often in the vocabulary. It's like what we're describing. Is it really AI? Um, I would say that I see that uh, the generative AI does play a place, particularly in the customer service, as it relates to our uh, how we support uh, the uptime of our, of our automated systems. The systems are deploying a form of AI that are, let's say they're collecting data, millions of data points every second to make informed decisions or to, or to lose, uh, empower operations to have visibility. Um, so I think AI is also making suggestions, not only on the automation level, but also on the operational level. You know, we used to talk about labor management. So I think it's there's more of a focus now for us is labor optimization. You know, being able to identify through, let's say, uh, the ERP system, you know, when orders are coming in, uh, what type of orders, be able to make suggestions to the operations, the ship operators from receiving to outbound, things like that. AI is very much in play there. And I and again, it's, it's advancing so rapidly that I, Talk to me in 12 months, I'll tell you what. Whatever. Bring you back, so, yeah. bring you back, yeah. Mohan. I mean, I agree with all that in the bill said, and you know, um, I'd, I'd add that, uh, you know, I have a PhD in operations research, and you know, you know, you and I discussed this multiple times, but we, we obviously fall in love with what we've, what we've studied, right? And uh, what, we, what I see is uh, the traditional methods still being deployed in a lot of the engines that we develop, and, it's diff and I, I have to force myself to say, not mixed integer linear programs, no 
uh, column generations, no Lagrangian relaxations, and all of those kinds of techniques. Go speaking adopt my language. You're speaking my language. <laughs> exactly. On. So go adopt the new technologies because those are the ones that are going to continue to improve over time. And we have to almost force ourselves to have an AI first approach, prove that AI doesn't work, and then go back to your traditional techniques. So I think that's something that I'm trying to kind of push, you know, even within my organization as well. Um, but the applications are like, you know, enormous. And I mean, I've been kind of thinking about it myself in the, imagine like a, a distribution center where, you know, you're able to feed all the data and then run a generative AI model on top of that. And you're able to say, you know, tell me this associate or, or this particular function on Wednesday, what the productivity of that is, or what were my bottlenecks? How many mischiefs did I have on Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. to noon? So all of these, you know, you make it a lot more interactive and you open it up for all the associates inside a building. And the power of that in terms of the actions that they can take to improve their work is phenomenal. Now, that's just a very small microcosm of what a typical AI application could be. Now you expand that to the overall supply chain and the, the use cases are like significant. So I think it is definitely a big, uh, it is coming. I, I, do, I do believe strongly that you know, there, is, there is value and uh, this will probably be another, call it a, a disruption that we will see in the coming 10 years. Yeah, I always challenge with what AI is because some people, it's, you know, if you use math in a computer, it's AI, right? As opposed to a generative. So there's that big spectrum of what it actually is and it depends by different people. But um, I want to thank the panel. Thank you for all your questions.